And so if we go to the catechism to get the proper definition of it, which we can also find in Pope Pius IX's bull Ineffabilis Deus, it says here, this is right above the part about Mary being the mother of God, quoting the Pope, it says, the most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later we see in Mysticus Corporis from Pope Pius XII, the affirmation that Mary was protected both from original sin and from personal sin. And so by being united uh, to her son, Mary is given a special grace from God to be protected from all sin. Just as you and I have original sin removed from in baptism, those graces were applied to Mary uh, when she was conceived. So she was conceived without original sin. Yeah, you wouldn't, you'd be so surprised how many people say, Oh, the Immaculate Conception. That's when, you know, Gabriel showed up to Mary. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's yeah. that happens so it, often. It it's, and just yeah. even the term is so misunderstood. But it refers to Our Lady being conceived without the stain of original sin. And, you know, people say, well, where's that in the Bible? And I think this is a really great example of a theological proof where sometimes math problem is... A plus B equals C, and you get A and B provided, and you have to solve for C. Well, if you're doing, this is almost like a little bit of a theological algebra, where it's yeah. like X plus B plus C equals whatever, and solve for X. You That's know? why lo Aristotelian logic in preparation for anybody studying theology, if you're studying theology, you must study philosophy. There's no, there's no replacement. And having a logical approach to this is mm -hmm. helpful because if we're going to have any type of theological expressions related to faith or related to God, and certainly what we ought to be drawing from the fountain of Scripture mm -hmm. and the biblical foundations of what we believe, we have to be able to draw these conclusions. And that's essentially what the magisterium of the church has been doing for mm -hmm. the past 2,000 plus years. Yeah, so. and this goes back to that first Marian dogma of that her being the Theotokos. Well, okay, if that is... If that's the the sum, that's the solution to the answer. Well, go back. Well, I think you can then infer and you can start to build the case for this by having that being an accepted dogma up front and then coming back around saying, okay, well, what are the ramifications of her being the bearer of God? What mm -hmm. are the ramifications of her divine motherhood? Can anything perfect come of anything impure and you can start to build the case backwards like that. And then when you when you're doing that, notice what's happening. We begin to uncover what, what's the central reality? Where, how do we bend our knee? Who who do we direct our adoration to? But Jesus Christ, That's you it. know, and and to realize what this means in the economy of salvation of what Trent was expressing before and the history of salvation, we begin to really see who the Blessed Virgin Mary is, because knowing Mary is knowing Christ and and seeing through this lens and what Christ is accomplishing is really very important for each of us. And, yeah. and we're, you know, thinking but, about this and discussing this is so important. And this is a really difficult one to defend. I don't even think I have a great arsenal in this, but they'll say, well, Mary is just a woman or Mary gave birth, you know, on Christmas. But then after that, you know, she was off to the casino and just like anyone else, you know, smoking and drinking and partying, just another Another fallen woman. So this is a really important one. Uh, Trent, give us some tools on how to defend this, because this is really yeah. difficult to defend, I think, for most people. Well, I think what people have to understand is, w as Catholics, we don't believe in sola scriptura. So we don't believe that every dogma of our faith has to be found explicitly in Scripture. Sola scriptura itself is not found there, of course, because it's not what the Bible teaches. So we have to resist the temptation. We have to biblically prove everything. Rather, I think we start with Mary as the mother of God, and that makes this very fitting, uh, that she's also this wonderful sign to us through being ever virgin. And so her being protected from sin would be something that's very fitting. It's not a proof, but it makes a lot of sense. Then I think we look to the sources of theology. We look to things like scripture. Uh, we see that the angel Gabriel greets Mary uh, as full uh, by a, by a name that's kind of like a title, Kekara Tomene in Greek, full of grace. Translated. I gotta learn Greek, by the way. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's a great thing to have. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> from the Greek word kara too, so grace, and it's a particular form of that word that would imply that someone has grace as an enduring aspect of their being. Now, once again, that's not a proof in and of itself, uh, but it certainly shows it as a sign in that direction, especially as it's used as a title to refer to Mary. And then uh, looking at the development in the church's history of the sacred tradition related to Mary, how we see a greater 
coalescing, if you will, or uh, forming of the church's opinion around how special and important Mary is, that if Mary is the ark, uh, you know, just as the ark of the covenant carried the word of God on stone tablets, the fathers of the church recognized that Mary is the new ark, that she carried the word of God within her womb. Uh, and if the ark was uh, without defect in the Old Testament, uh, it's it's pure and without defect in the new. And so in the Catechism, paragraph 493, it says the fathers of the Eastern tradition called Mary Panagia, the all holy, free from any stain of sin, uh, as though fashioned by the Holy Spirit and formed as a new creature. Uh, and so uh, we see this this greater, this trajectory of understanding of Mary's identity and role in relation to Jesus in that way. So I think for me that this is reflected in scripture. We see its growth and development within the sacred tradition. And if Christ establishes church, uh, it can faithfully guide us in having this correct knowledge of Mary. So would it be fair or how can you explain maybe the the timeline of this? Is it almost like a, a special dispensing of the grace of Calvary and the grace of baptism before they were instituted because God is not bound by time? Or is it a special yeah. favor, you know, that kind of precedes that? Yeah, well, I mean, God is omnipotent, so he's able to uh, dispense his grace and favor to people in any way that he chooses. But when we look at the tradition of the church, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to say that the merits that Christ uh, merited for us on the cross, uh, those salvific merits can be applied to Mary because God, of course, is outside of time. Uh, he's able to apply that to her so that she, just as you and I have sin taken away through baptism that comes to us from the merits of Christ on the cross in the past, Mary received a kind of proto-baptism in her own conception from these merits that would later be received in the future. And so that perfectly makes sense to, to see Mary's uh, role in the economy of salvation. Yeah.